Thank you. Yes, hello. My name is Christina, and I like writing documentation. Um, I work at Catalyst IT in Wellington, New Zealand, and uh, when I moved there back in June 2010, I, was, uh, I started to be involved primarily in the Mahara Open Source Project, for which we are the uh, core maintainers. And um, I have a number of roles in there. So one is contributor, and that also means giving support in the com open source community and just answering questions for users. Um, I also do a fair bit of testing, so when people have questions, we just try to kind of, in terms of answering and helping them out, see if we can get it to work or whether they are on a different version and they would need to upgrade or just really trying to be helpful. And sometimes uh, I also get the chance to change something in core Mahara, primarily language strings though, because I'm not a developer, so I can't really code anything, but I still be, uh, I'm still able to make contributions to the core software by just changing some small things in there that are quite trivial. And um, I'm also quite heavily involved in our code review system, Garrett, which we're using for any code that it wants to go into our master branch, also into our stable branches, it needs to go through a code review system. And so, of course, it's not just for code review, but also for the verification on the front end. So again, these are things that I, as non-developer, can take care of. But there are also a number of other things that I do, and amongst them is documentation management, which is the focus for today's presentation. And um, I really started it because once upon a time, um, we only had our documentation in MediaWiki, and prior to that in a different wiki software, and it was just where everything else lived. We also had our user documentation, and it had been written pretty much for version 1.0, and then slightly updated maybe for version 1.2, and there were a couple of screenshots and three steps and so on for version 1.3, but nothing really comprehensive. So whenever we needed to give support in the community, we ended up writing steps in the forum posts and said, oh, you need to go to this page, you need to do da 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 and also provide a screenshot. And at some point, I got really annoyed by that because every single time I needed to do that, unless I found the forum post again where I had written that instruction already. And um, that, of course, also meant everybody else was doing better. The grass was always greener on the other side. All other projects had better user documentation than we did. And so back in 2011, we looked at a number of um, documentation tools, talked to a few people, and eventually decided to use Sphinx as documentation management or as documentation compiler. And of course, I could have just said, oh, we are using Sphinx, but um, I decided to. Um, put this presentation forward at LCA because it is not just Sphinx that we are using. And um, what I really want to do today is kind of give you an insight into all the other tools that we're using around it in order to actually write the documentation because there's much more involved. Because Sphinx pretty much is just the compiler. It's a really nice piece of software and it does the job very well, but you're actually not really writing your documentation in Sphinx. So, if you want to check out our documentation, you can find it on manual.mahara.org. And uh, by now we are, at, or we are starting to do version six of it. So I started back in 2011 with Mahara 1.4, and we are going to be doing the documentation now for Mahara 1.9. Currently we are on stable Mahara 1.8, and therefore every half year I need to update the documentation for our new release because we are in a six monthly release cycle. And currently I'm the main maintainer of the documentation. We've had some contributions um, for small things, but the primary bulk of, or the bulk of the work is for me to update the documentation all the time. And I try to do that continuously, so whenever we get a new feature into the software, before it's being released, so when it's just in the master branch, I start documenting it, just so that it's not this huge piece of work at the end, right before the release, and I'm being the bottleneck there. But sometimes things just need to wait. And so we are using Sphinx, and Sphinx supports restructured text. And um, the important thing here is for Sphinx actually to say is that we are not using it for developer documentation. Mahara is written in PHP, so we can't even get any code out of the comments and kind of automatically have Sphinx compile it. I really just use it for the user documentation. 
So I need to write everything myself, and we are using restructured text for it, because RST is a really, really easy markup language. As you can see here, you can have uh, where institutions is, the underline just represents heading level one. Then there's a heading level two very easily. You have your simple lists, and you can make um, things in bold and italics and so on. And um, you can also have so-called includes um, to use commonly used images that you want to use in a lot of files, don't always have to write a lot of um, text all the time, but just simply include it in a file that you can always call upon. And so that looks something like this. When I have an include, all I need is pipe, in this case new in Mahara 1.8, that also then becomes the tag of the image. Add another pipe and out I get this, our little icon for indicating that it's a new version of our menu, that something changed or that we have a new functionality in there. That's also how we indicate to people something is new. And then on top of that, um, we also use the index generation quite heavily so that um, all new things also get put into the index as well as existing things as well. So with Sphinx, you have very easy tool on hand to write your index and have that generated automatically when you just use a few lines of code. And you can create as many index entries as you want. And we can also use anchors for cross-references. So when I want to link from one file to another within the documentation, all I really, again, just need is a small command, and then I can reuse that in, uh, somewhere else in the text and make links from one file to another. And of course, I need an editor. Earlier on, you said, <laughs> all I need for my documentation is an editor and a spell checker. Um, pretty much that's true for text. And I found that Genie is actually a really, really nice editor for writing my documentation in RST because it provides me with a structure on the left-hand side if I use headings properly. So if I have structured my document with headings one, two, and three, and so on, then all these show up. And the nice thing is when I jump to one of these headings on the left-hand side in my structure, I immediately am pointed to the right-hand side there as well in the text. So some of my files are pretty long because um, there's just a lot to document, and therefore that makes it easier just to scroll through a document quickly or to get to the point where you want to be. And um, it is also quite easy to do um, search and replacing in a number of documents, and so I really like Genius um, Editor. Wouldn't really want to do it in Vim or any other one because that just gets a bit too messy with large documents. Um, since we are writing a user documentation, I need to put a lot of screenshots in there because I don't just want to have text, because I do want to show people, okay, when you're in version Mahara 1.4, that's what this page looks like, whereas when you're in version 1.8, it looks quite different, simply because we added functionality. So for me, a user documentation needs to have quite a lot of screenshots. And I pretty much wrote the documentation in a way that I'd like to have documentations written that help me to work with them. And um, so far, a lot of people also said that that's quite helpful for them. So we are continuing in that way and having a lot of screenshots and then text below it. And as you can see here, it's just a regular screenshot. So I use Skimp for making it, but you could use any other screenshotting software. But we use Skimp so that we can also get these callouts. So kind of the numbers in circles. And there is a GIMP plugin which allows you to pretty much stamp these callouts onto an image and they auto-increment the numbers. And that's really nifty because you, when you write a documentation, you don't really want to spend up aligning the numbers in the circles and then kind of putting numbers in there and then writing circles again or have 100 numbers in a file and then always pulling them over onto a screenshot. And um, one of our contributors to the Mahara project, he adopted the existing script for us so that all I needed to do was install the script and I had my green, the size, and all that I needed um, for my, making my callouts. Um, another thing that we also use is errors. Not as heavily as callouts because I usually only use them when I really need to point to things where there's a conglomeration of stuff. But um, these errors, um, are also generated by a plugin in GIMP. 
And I actually keep some of those errors in an extra file so I can always make sure they are the same size um, so that I don't always need to remember which numbers I put in for the length of the arrow or the width of the, the wings and so on. If you are using um, just Ubuntu, you have a greater alternative in Shutter. And that's actually what we used in the beginning to make these callouts and also the errors because as you can see, the callouts are a bit finer. They are not as grainy as the ones in GIMP. But because uh, when, I was, when I started writing the documentation, uh, our translators got really interested in it and they are not all Ubuntu or Debian users. And therefore we needed to find a way so that they can also make screenshots pretty much replicating what I'm doing in English in their language, but just working on Windows or on a Mac computer. And that's where GIMP came in and the plugin that we are using so that the documentation and also the callouts, even the callouts, look pretty much the same when a, a translator works around it. But in general, um, it's fairly similar process and it works really well for us because what I'm trying to do is not really clutter screenshots with any text because text is not accessible. And therefore, what I do put into the screenshots is just these callouts and then underneath I have all the explanations and can be more wordy as well and explain things and format things more nicely than if I had just everything in the screenshot. But I also don't just want to plonk the screenshot in there because that doesn't really help people find things. And sometimes you do need to see things in context. So I couldn't just cut out the new collection button and then write about that. But I do want to show also where things are located on a screen when somebody looks at it directly. Okay, so that's pretty much the text and also the um, graphical side of things. And now Sphinx come in, comes into play because once you have Sphinx installed, all you need to do is type in the command make HTML, make LaTeX PDF, or make EPUB, and whoops de whoops, here documentation is there. You can see though that I'm using a different command. I'm using make preview mahara equals 1.8, and I'll come back to that in a little bit because a little more magic happens right during that command. As you can see just in the line below, um, it also looks into languages, so we are going to translate our documentation. And so as I just said, um, we are doing, uh, putting out HTML, EPUB, and PDF. HTML because it's really easy to work on the internet. You also get a full text search with Sphinx um, so that people can just search your documentation really easily. We do have a PDF because some people like to download things and sometimes even print things out. By now, documentation isn't really conducive to printing because it's over 350 pages long and large PDF, so sometimes the screenshots are very large or you have empty pages, but still it's, it's quite a big document. And EPUB, it's just for all those users who do want to put it onto their mobile devices and then just uh, flip through the documentation easily. And Sphinx provides that to, to you all built in. You don't really have to do anything off that. Just with one little command, you can get all three or even more um, outputs. It also does a man page, but in the case of my user manual, that's not really the best way to use. And so we primarily have HTML, EPUB, and PDFs there. And of course, working in a software development company, I was indoctrinated to Git, and that's where we also store the documentation. It does not go through our code review system yet because I'm the only one writing it, so it would be kind of a bit too much work around it um, if I first needed to wait until it was going through the code review. I do have our translators who, when they come across a mistake, they just send me an email and that seems to work best then filing a bug first and then going through the regular steps. But maybe in the future. And as you can also see, my Git branch is not really that exciting because I'm the only one contributing to it. So it's pretty much just one branch and no side branching there. Because um, we are, even though we are extending the documentation and um, also updating it for one version, most of the time it's just small fixes, so we are not bringing out uh, the manual version 1.8.1 or so, but just put it, put it onto the server immediately, and then people always have the latest version. 
Our menu is, um, just as a side note, is being generated once every day automatically on the server. And by now, because we have to generate six versions, and in three different formats, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes. And because we also have the languages and translations in there. So it's quite a heavy process, but since it's done only once a day, um, it's pretty OK. OK, I already mentioned a couple of times that we are having translations. And um, that was not intended in the beginning. First, I thought, oh, I'll write the thing in English, and it's going to be quite large. But then our German translator and also the French one and the Spanish one came and said, oh, it'd be really interesting to actually have the user manual in our languages. And so we looked into how we can actually do that. And since we used Launchpad for our translations for our main project, Mahara, we also thought, well, that would be a good idea. And fortunately, Sphinx makes it e really easy for you to generate PO files. And you could even kind of create an automated process to put them into a Git branch and then have Launchpad pick them up and then put the translated versions back into Git. So that's why we sticked with Launchpad or stuck with Launchpad because we, we know the product, we know how to work with it, and um, our translators also use it all the time and they know how to work with it as well. Uh, Version 1.5 of the user manual was fully translated in German at one point, and now the translator needs to keep up a bit for the later versions because, unfortunately, Sphinx doesn't, can't really deal well with fuzzy translations. So whenever I just even make a comma change or change one word in my language string, Launchpad only recognizes that as a new language string. So the translators always need to look at even the smallest mistakes and corrections that I made. And um, that is something that would be nice in the future to have changed so that I can make small changes that don't really affect the translations and they don't have to redo so much. And that's why there are quite a number of language strings currently untranslated because they need to match them up properly again to the current translations that they have. But as you can see, we've got German pretty well covered. French is very well on the way. Dutch has been started. Um, what you can see further down is Japanese. Um, our Japanese translator, he's also chucking along really, really well. And it's, these translators are amazing because the user manual is quite, quite large. Um, there are currently around um, 3,659 language strings, which may not sound that big. But you have to remember, when you write a user manual, you have a paragraph. And a paragraph is a language string. So sometimes these strings can be quite long. And um, so it's not just translating individual words or small phrases, but really sometimes quite a bit of um, things just in one string alone. So they are really doing awesome work there. So now how does that tie into Sphinx? Um, once we, we knew that Sphinx um, could deal with translations, but it can only deal with translations of text because it is developer documentation. And developer documentation doesn't always have screenshots in there. Um, but being a user documentation, we needed screenshots. And ideally, also screenshots translated, meaning because there's no automated way of translating a screenshot into a different language, that when I took a screenshot in English, the German translator needed to take the same screenshot again, just with a German language pack. And um, one of our developers um, made a customization to Sphinx and created some Python scripts, which are the magic, beyond the magic of Sphinx, um, which allows us to put the translated screenshots into a specific directory in Git, and during the compilation process of the documentation, instead of using the English to screenshots, the German, French, Dutch, and so on screenshots are taken and put, um, compiled into the translated version of the user manual. And so when you go to the user manual on the homepage, or uh, yeah, on the website, and you click on especially German version 1.5, you'll see that the screenshots are just translated. So instead of the Germans then reading English text, they have the German text as they would see it with their language pack installed in the user manual as well. So it's a, it can be a fully translated user manual and not just 
the text. And that's kind of the, the biggest magic for me behind it because that really makes it a uh, complete language uh, or complete translation there because it is not just the text that is being translated but also the images which of course are a lot of times important to people who are not always fluent in English when they work with the software because they just see different words on the screen and sometimes these, these words can differ quite heavily. As you can see here from quota, it is um, contingent in German. And so if you would see quota, you couldn't really kind of transfer it easily for some users. Okay, um, a last tool which is not really used so much for writing the documentation, but for getting some data for the documentation is PWIC. Um, it's a web analytics tool and we started using it recently again after a while um, because PWIC2 was just released a, about a month ago and it has some really cool features in there. Um, they updated the map so that it's actually now properly correct so that it doesn't go according to the browser language I was told. And then you've got your regular statistics of visitors, how long they stayed on it, which pages they visited and so on. But what I was really curious to see is uh, this keywords uh, part that they also have in there because if your software allows you to have a, um, a search or has a full text search included, you can also pipe that through to PWIC and it picks up the keywords. So now over time I can look at all these keywords and see what people were actually looking for in the user manual, what they wanted to know about, and then improve the user manual in that regard and make additional index entries or <coughs> use these words also in, uh, when I'm writing the user documentation. So that's a really nice tool which goes kind of beyond the analytics tool which it was in the beginning where you just saw access and these things like, but uh, where, it, where you can also gather more data about your users and find out more how they are actually really behaving and what they are looking for. So altogether, the documentation now has around 92,000 words. I used um, web word count for that because I didn't know how, to, how else to find that out from my individual files. And so hopefully it's, it's somewhat correct. And it has 438 images. We started out with about 54,000 words back in 2011 and around 290 images. But of course, over time, I included more screenshots and um, also new functionality needed to be documented better. So that's why we are quite heavily now on the images. And um, it's quite a feat to update those from one version to the other, especially when we make major changes in the UI um, for versions 1.6 to 1.7 or so, I didn't really have to update the screenshots much because the UI stayed the same, but now Mahara 1.8 looks quite different. The um, icons are bigger, we make lots of layout changes, and so I pretty much had to redo every screenshot. And that is where GIMP can come in quite handily, especially when you save the original files because all these callouts that you saw earlier, they are put onto individual layers. And so all I need to do is take my screenshot, put it into the original file, and ju then just um, rearrange the callouts with all, without always having to go through the same process of stamping them, and that does really save some time. So here are some the, the links to all the tools that I'm using and also to our Git repository where you can find the manual itself um, or where you can also find the scripts which include the um, scripts also for translating the screenshots and our packaging, packaging scripts to put them onto the server and all the other tools that I um, just talked about. And these, this presentation will be on SlideShare later and also be recorded and the organization team has the PDF as well. And yes, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now or you're welcome to shoot me an email later on if um, you can't think of a question at the moment but would like to look at something further. Yes, please. Um, it's, it's kind of part of the process. 
So I, I pretty much look at all the changes that are made in the software. And our software is, or our team is relatively small, so I still manage to do that. And whenever I see something that requires a user documentation change, either because it's changing something that a user sees or some functionality, then I try to up, uh, update the documentation immediately. Or if I don't have time because I'm doing some other things, then I put a tag on Launchpad so that I can go back to it prior to the next release of the software and really make, um, make sure that I change everything. But pretty much um, before we release the software again, I go through, ev through everything in the documentation and make sure that um, everything is still there or make small tweaks. Mm -hmm. so can you just yeah. the oh, yes. Yeah. So, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, the question was whether it is part of the workflow of updating, of um, yeah, writing a patch and putting it into a software and then also updating the documentation right there. Yes, two please. questions. First sure. question is, who generates the language strings for the software itself? OK, first question is, who generates the language strings for the software itself? Um, you mean for the manual or for Mahara? No, for Mahara. For Mahara. Um, that is the soft, um, Mahara itself. Sorry, I don't quite. The, so, the software and the manual are quite, quite separate. So I'm not interfacing with, with our software at all. They are two separate projects in, in a sense. But we, we use regular language strings as you would in PHP. And then they are being converted into PO files and put into Launchpad. For the software? For the software, yes. So the translators that are doing the manual are also the translators that are doing the software? Yes, that's correct in our case. Mm -hmm. All right. Second question is, who generates the screenshots for the foreign language stuff? So uh, the, this question was, who generates the language, uh, the screenshots in the other languages? That is the translators themselves as well. So why is your computer not taking a screenshot of all languages as you generate the screenshot? That's a very good question, which um, I came across this morning when I was talking to Francois about it, um, because we were just yeah, just discussing the presentation briefly, and I realized, well, it might, might actually be easier if when I take the screenshot to just switch the language and then just take the screenshot as well so that the translators don't have to do that. And um, I'll definitely investigate that further because there are apparently two possibilities. And maybe some one of you has actually a possible solution which would make it easier since there's no easy way of generating screenshots always in the same size. And uh, one would be that we make a change to Mahara so that I don't always have to go to the account settings and change the language so that I just have an easy language switcher invisible somewhere so that I can change it or work with different windows. Um, and the other thing would be if it's possible that we can use um, the language detection in the browsers and make Mahara be able to detect the language that your browser has and then choose the main language accordingly. Right now it is always the user's choice. So currently we don't have any browser language detection in there. So that would probably be the, the more difficult thing where I definitely need a developer to do it and make a change. But um, it would certainly be, be better. And um, that's definitely something I want to investigate further because it certainly makes more sense when I'm doing the screenshots to immediately take them also in the other languages. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that suggestion. Right. <laughs> Jessica. I was, was going to ask the same question about the workflow and the screenshots. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Jessica was just making the suggest a suggestion to use a private browsing uh, session in the browser so that I could uh, log in as a different user and always stay in the other language. And then just swap out the kind of the screenshot 
behind the callouts, and that's what I'm also already doing for the new versions because then I really don't need to stamp anymore, but just rearrange, and sometimes it's not really a lot of rearranging, but that would certainly help me um, keep the size of the screenshots the same all the time. Yeah, and it um, helps them make the um, translate the user manual faster because the screenshots do take a lot of time. And when we started, <coughs> sorry, when we started out with the German translation, I actually gave them my entire database and the files so that they could at least have the same users in there and also the same content that I had already generated. And that's something where I'd need to look into a bit more because currently I have a fake user there. And so if I'm logged in as um, somebody else, then I just need to make sure that I also have access to that user. But that is not really insurmountable there. Bruno. The extension to things that mm -hmm. Um, it's right there. It's on Gitorius under Mahara Manual Packaging. That's where all these uh, scripts are. <coughs> um, sorry, we haven't upstreamed it to Sphinx yet. Um, it will probably need a little bit more work to kind of get some of the crazy code out there, uh, but it's uh, definitely something that we could log into because I find it really, really useful. But it's definitely out in the open, and everybody can already play around with it or give us some tips, especially those who are Sphinx developers and kind of know how to write in the standards that the project is using. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Um, what I haven't tried it is how our scripts work with uh, Sphinx 1.2, which just came out. So that'll be interesting, and hopefully we, we can upgrade to the latest version quickly because that is especially also has some translation advantage or um, features in there that are very good for translations because currently not everything is translated in Sphinx, and so we would be able to take advantage of some of these new ones, uh, new features in there. Yes, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, we looked at a few things. Um, initially, we talked with the translation manager, um, Nicole, of the Koha Library Management System, because we are also working heavily with them. We looked at how Moodle does its documentation, and we looked at ASCII doc and also Pelican. And um, honestly, we started out using ASCII doc, but for whatever reason, I could not get going. There was one strange invisible barrier there, um, but when Francois told me about Sphinx, and we looked into that, the market between Sphinx and um, or restructured text and ASCII doc is not too different, but for some reason it was easier for me to get my head around that, and that's when we started using it. It is also a larger community, and uh, at least as far as I've seen, and we started out using read the docs, which hosted our Mahara documentation because that is a service uh, where you can connect your Git repository and it generates the Sphinx documentation automatically for you. So that was a very easy way for us to get our new revised documentation up and running quickly without having to log into a server setup ourselves. Only when we started working with the translation did we need to uh, move to our own server. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, I forgot to um, repeat the question. The question was whether we looked at other um, documentation management tools. Yes, please. When you do the screenshots, do you do those manually or are they scripted? I do them manually because um, our uh, question was when we do the screenshots, do we do them manually or do we have a script for it? Um, I do them manually and if you have any idea of how I can script that, I'd love to talk to you. To check your word count is funnily enough word count WC. Okay, the command for checking my word count is word, um, WC. Does that go for just uh, within one file, or can I check that across an entire directory? Across everything. I'll definitely talk to you after the presentation. Thank you so much.
Yeah, I've sometimes should have probably talked to some of our developers. They wouldn't. They might know these things as well, but um, yeah, it was just in this case easier just to Google it and find the word count website there. And it, it is actually a pretty cool website because it gives you also the text that is in alt text, the, the irregular text, and it counts everything up, and you can check an entire website for it, so not just one file. So but it's kind of something interesting probably to look at as well. Kathy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done a lot of analytics around it yet since we just got back into using PWIC. We are in the fortunate position that two of the core members are sitting at Catalyst and working out of our office. And so we can just tap their shoulders. And um, so it was really, really nice just to, to talk to them about PWIC2 and that's when I discovered the, the keywords. And so that's what I do need to look at over the next few months and see what I can extract out of it. But I do know that a lot of members from the community really appreciate the documentation because they know they can go there and they find step-by-step um, -step, um, guides or also the screenshots. And we use it really heavily when giving support in the forums. We oftentimes link to the documentation instead of um, uploading a screenshot again. We give them the steps or link to the steps. And the nice thing really is when community members do the same. So when we don't give support, but when somebody else says, oh, you just need to check the manual, it's right there, and they put the link in. And that's when you also know that they are actually using the manual and that it is very helpful for them. What we have not done yet or something that I know of that hasn't happened yet is that others take the manual and make their own screenshots or adapt it for their own universities or schools, for example, in making their own manual. I mean, the manual is being released under a double license of GPL and also Creative Commons by SA. And so anybody could just take it and change it to their own institution, but oftentimes they just link to the regular manual there. <coughs> you with this uh, beautiful towel on behalf of LCA 2014. That was the best looking presentation I've seen so far in the past two and a half days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael.